Hi everyone, I'm Bruno and today I'm going to talk about the seven most common pitfalls that I experienced after developing several AWS solutions. Before we start, allow me to quickly introduce myself. I work as head of technology and architecture at Fortum, a, new, a leading European energy company where I drive the technology strategy and governance and I help different software development teams. Uh, we build really cool solutions in the areas of clean tech and sustainability. So if you haven't heard about Fortune, you should definitely check it out. Um, throughout my career, uh, I've been working across different industries like energy, manufacturing, media, cybersecurity, where I've been essentially designing and developing multiple cloud-based solutions. Um, my areas of interest are naturally cloud, uh, but also DevOps, security, data engineering, and, and AI. Uh, I'm an avid learner, uh, having completed several uh, AWS, Azure, and Google Cloud certifications. I've been working with AWS for the past uh, nine years and with Azure and Google Cloud for the past two. Um, in addition to consume content, I also like to produce content. Uh, so I'm actually an author. Uh, I, I published an AWS security specialty course, and I regularly write in different, uh, in different mediums. Um, this talk comes as a bit of a recollection of, you know, having thought about different uh, AWS solutions where, where I either uh, designed or reviewed or developed, um, I came to the realization that there are kind of like seven key things that, that is, are always like kind of challenges that you always encounter in them. Uh, some, of course, some, some solutions, they, they already addressed uh, most of them, some of them uh, are kind of uh, kind of missing entirely. And I thought that it was really good to maybe start compiling the, those uh, those learnings so that I can share with you that uh, about them. And it doesn't really matter which type of solution you have been working in AWS. Um, I'm pretty sure that that you will kind of this will resonate with you. And starting with the kind of the first thing and the first lesson is that that I learned, you know, having worked with us for a while is that the new AWS accounts uh, need love. So when you create a new AWS account, uh, if you are not so familiar with AWS, you actually might miss this. Um, and there are three critical steps that you should always do when, you, when uh, an AWS account is new. And one is to enable multi-factor authentication in the root account. Uh, the root account basically is the most privileged account that you have in the account and you can do pretty much anything with it without restrictions. So please do make sure to enable multi-factor authentication. Um, this is something that people often forget, um, especially in like sandbox type of accounts. And the other is that uh, use the AWS identity and access management. So instead of using the root account uh, to, to actually do in your day-to-day -to, -day to do operations in the AWS account, uh, start using immediately um, IAM. And the way that you can do it uh, is to, you, know, you can create a user uh, for yourself and to assign uh, a policy to it that allows you to do the operations that you want and therefore managing uh, the things in a bit more uh, effective way. And the reason that it, this needs to happen is that if you use the root account for both interacting with the console, or for instance, if you are using root account to issue, issue access keys, there is no way that you have to restrict them. So if someone, if those access keys are leaked, the person, uh, the malicious actor that, that gets access to that can do, use them to do anything in the account. There's, there's no caps on spending, for instance, as long as your credit card is running. So really important to do that. And the third thing is to enable uh, the AWS CloudTrail. So the cl AWS CloudTrail is something that you can easily enable in the account. And it, was ba it will basically log any kind of API call that happens within the account. So for instance, when you are interacting with the AWS console, uh, that issues uh, in the background is issuing, of course, different API calls to, you know, to what is the, uh, to describe the amount of the, what are the EC2 instances that you have or to describe the X amount of resources. Um, so all of those calls can be automatically logged if you have CloudTrail enabled. So this allows you to actually kind of have an audit trail of who did what and when in your account. And those are three things that are, you know, takes like five minutes to, to start doing and often people forget. 
Um, one interesting tidbit is that uh, AWS has the AWS Trusted Advisor, which is something that you can go and check in the account right away. And it kind of will check in your account for if you are following some recommendations. And actually some of those recommendations are essentially this that I was uh, describing that if you are using IAM or if you have MFA enabled, which is kind of funny that is that that's not mandatory by default, right? So it's something that often is overlooked uh, and that's kind of the first pitfall. The second one is kind of also a bit related in a way, um, which is that I kind of touched already that when you are using uh, AWS in a new AWS account, there's no really a cap to, the, to how much you are spending in the account. Uh, so uh, what I see in a lot of uh, both in individual accounts or team accounts or, or in entire organizations is that they don't really make cost management as a priority. And that has ramifications, not just for the development team, but to the entire organization. So two things that you can start actively doing, one is enabling AWS budgets. Uh, AWS budgets allows you to define um, a billing alarm. So say that you, you want to spend in that AWS account, you know, let's say $1,000 per month. What happens is that you can, if you, if you define that as a budget, uh, you, will, you, can, you, will you will start receiving alerts uh, when the predictive spending for that month will go like 80% of that. So you start, you get kind of an early alert in case the account starts, in, in case the costs of the account start to go a bit high. Um, and the other is that when you actually get that bill, um, you should really understand uh, where are you actually spending the money? So uh, you can use AWS Cost Explorer or something similar to actually granularly see how much uh, each resource is costing you. And this is something that there's a kind of two challenges that I commonly see in projects. One is that the development team often does not really have the visibility over the costs. So if you are an engineering manager, uh, please do make sure that your developers and, and, uh, and cloud specialists, they can really see how much is costing each account that they are touching because they actually have, they are in a better position to make decisions on uh, if that money is being well spent or not. Um, often what, what I see in organizations is that, uh, you know, the bill comes in the end of the month and someone uh, kind of blindly almost approves it and, and, and that's it. I mean, that's not really a way to, to, to deal with costs. So making cost management as a priority means that also the cloud costs and controlling that needs to be part of the technology governance of the organization. Uh, so, you know, two things, give visibility to the, to the development teams and as an organization, form a group where you can actually track and make sure that this is being well spent. If you wanna read more actually about the film, if you wanna learn more about this, I actually wrote an article and you have a, a link uh, here on the slide where you can actually check how can you actually get the most out of the AWS cost management tools. The third thing um, that often lacks in projects is the lack of multi-account governance. And this has multiple ramifications. It's actually quite common that if I'm jumping to a project that that project that's already an ongoing project that I didn't define from the start uh, is actually quite common that they are using a single AWS account. And that's not really a good practice for many, many reasons. One is that, uh, of course, you know, it, it kind of makes easy at first for development teams to start deploying things in AWS. But if you have your development environment, staging environment, production environment, all mixed in the same account, it's, you are actually like, it's a recipe for, for disaster waiting to happen because you cannot really limit the, uh, the blast radius in the case of an incident. So if, if your resources get, get hacked, basically all your environments are, are hacked. Um, or for instance, if you have auto-scaling groups uh, for development and, and, and production, uh, you might very quickly start hitting on the service limit. So, Service limits are in AWS defined per account. So per account, you could have, for instance, like you can have in this account, 50 EC2 uh, virtual machines. 
and no more than that. Of course, you can tweak those limits, um, but that is a manual always process to go and tweak those limits. And what happens that if you have everything in the same account, you will, will very quickly start hitting those limits. And something that you might be working as a development part might actually interfere then with production. So it's always good to separate those. Uh, and per project, you know, it, go with first like three accounts, one for development, one for staging, one for production. It doesn't really cost anything that you have multiple accounts and it really helps you to have more clear boundaries. Uh, how you can do this uh, easily is by using AWS organizations and AWS control tower. And this kind of leads a bit also to, to the part of the governance, which is that, you know, often in an organization is not just a single project, you have multiple projects. So you will be looking at a huge amount of, of AWS accounts. And one of the things that you can help, you can do to, to help uh, to make that a bit easier to manage is to, to use this control tower, for instance, to, uh, to create a landing zone, which defines for instance, what is the, when you create a new account, what is the baseline things that are in that account? Um, it also helps you to define guardrails. So for instance, you can define, uh, things that, that, that cannot happen in, in, in the account. Um, and using organizations, you can use, you can create uh, service control policies that will enable you to actually put restrictions to, to the account. So this is something that if you look from a perspective of what I was describing about the root account can do anything, or the root, sorry, the root, yeah, the root user can do anything in the AWS account. Actually, if you use AWS organizations, you can actually use the service control policies to try to limit a little bit uh, what is actually what the, what that the root account can do. So, um, if you are using single account, comes a bit with that problem that there's no way for you to limit. If you are using multiple accounts with AWS organizations and control tower, you can actually start putting a bit those limits, and also kind of as a byproduct of that. One of the things that you gain is consolidated billing. So, you know, when you might imagine that you, when you have multiple AWS accounts, you don't want to get multiple bills in the end of the month. So, by using this, you also gain a bit the consolidated billing. So, you get one bill to the entire organization, which makes things a lot easier. So, don't skip on, you know, don't be afraid of using multiple AWS accounts. It's a, it's a kind of a, a pitfall that happens quite a lot that uh, people try to shove everything in the same account and it doesn't really fly. Um, and kind of the other one um, that kind of connects a little bit with this, which is often I see uh, development teams that miss on infrastructure as code practices. So it's actually, if it's not the project that I am starting, uh, if it's something that I'm I'm getting involved already in the middle, uh, I see this happening a lot. That that the, it was for instance, it was like a POC that was developed without any kind of infrastructure as code, um, and that is really really challenging because you, if if you are do if you are deploying all the resources from the console, uh, what happens that there's no really a way for for me that that go to the account to reproduce what you did. So infrastructure as code nowadays starts to be kind of like really the norm. I'm super happy that in the past years that it really took off. Um, it allows you to, you know, essentially to, to write your entire AWS resources uh, as code. So it allows you to, uh, to re redeploy them uh, as, as you, any, many times as you want. It allows for better scalability. Um, it's also a way for you to actually document what actually happens. So I can actually retrace in a way the steps. Uh, I can go, for instance, to, to Git and see like who uh, changed that resource and, and when. And that helps also a lot to, to actually kind of, you know, in a way, self-document the code, so to say, uh, which makes things a lot more maintainable. There are many ways to, to do infrastructure as code. Um, honestly, like I have my own preferences, but as long as you are using infrastructure as code, I think that that's the that's the, the, the pitfall that you need to, to make sure uh, to use uh, at any of the infrastructure as code tools. Um, AWS has CloudFormation and SAM, and now there's also CDK. Those are the built-in tools, but you also have like Terraform and Serverless Framework and Pulumi, a bunch of them. So definitely like do 
check it out if you are not familiar with infrastructure as code and 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 uh, try to to get started. Um, it's actually like a quick throwback because my first uh, talk in AWS Community Summit online in the first one in 2019 in Manchester was precisely about this topic. Uh, and you, you have like the video and slides are available so you can actually go and check it out where I'm talking about comparing a little bit between uh, serverless, uh, in a serverless project, how you can do the same thing with AWS SAM, CloudFormation and Terraform. Uh, so do go and check it out if you have a chance. Um, the other pitfall is not using IAM properly. So I kind of touch a bit that you, when you create, when, when you create a new AWS account, you should start using uh, identity and access management instead of the root account. But what I usually find out is that, uh, well, people are not really using that properly. Uh, and that's kind of big, big uh, no-no, so to say. So if you look at this kind of policy statement uh, in, in the screen, you will see this kind of resource uh, um, asterisk. So, so everything allowed. And, and I mean, I'm guilty of this myself throughout my career. Like I think everyone that worked with AWS did this at some point. Um, but I think that's kind of, there are now uh, a lot, is a lot easier now to start doing the right thing. So do pay attention, especially when you are uh, building something uh, to run in production. You're not just trying out uh, a proof of concept for yourself. You are actually building a solution. Uh, do make sure that you are using the least privilege, uh, policy, uh, least privilege in policies. And I know that IAM can be like kind of scary. So, you know, I think I can actually give you like a 60 second primer. Um, so in, in IAM, you have different identities and you have users, groups, and roles. And you can imagine users as humans or non-AWS resources. So for instance, it can be if you are using a third party CI CD uh, technology that they need, uh, they need, they will ask you for an access uh, key uh, to, to interact with your AWS account that you essentially will create the user and issue those. So a user can be a human or non-AWS resources. Um, there is a temptation that people uh, will create a user for AWS resources. And that's kind of actually something that, that I encounter quite a lot. And you have, have, you have absolutely no need to do that because um, for that, you can use a role. And a role is something that you can create uh, and assign to AWS resources. So for instance, you can create a role to assign to your EC2 instance, or you can create a role to assign to, um, to, to an RDS database. Uh, so you can create a role to assign to AWS resources. And that is a lot more secure than, than creating a user and issue access keys that, that are very hard to actually then control and manage. Uh, and group is essentially a collection of, of, of users. Right, so those are the three identities. And now comes like the tricky part, which is the policies. And policies, there are essentially three types of policies. You have uh, AWS managed policies that are curated and maintained by AWS and you can simply assign. Um, there's customer managed, managed ones, which you create yourself and you can have this fine granularity and inline policies that are assigned, uh, that are created along with the entity. And essentially these policies are then assigned to user groups or roles. Um, in the case, I will definitely recommend it to avoid using inline and AWS managed policies because the AWS managed policies tend to be a bit more permissive and they don't really follow the list privilege uh, principle when it comes to what you actually need for that case. So there's a temptation that you will assign an AWS managed policy that will actually have more things than actually you will actually need. And the inline policies, I don't usually recommend because there's no reusability. So those are, you, you write the, them along, along the, the identity and you don't have a way to assign them to multiple identities. Um, so when possible, try to avoid using, go with the customer managed policies. And when you have the need to interact with AWS, so usually like development teams, they, of course, they tend to create uh, um, a user for each developer. 
which is okay, but is very in a, in a in a corporate world is very hard to to actually maintain. So when possible, you should actually use AWS SSO, um, so the single sign-on, where you where you can have like you know what your Microsoft AD or whatnot um, in your company, you can connect that with the with the AWS account, and basically that allows you to authenticate using your corporate credentials, and that allows to you to exchange exchange that that to with an IAM uh, role. So essentially, you use the same uh, credentials that you are using in your in, in your corporate email, so to say, and you are exchanging that with with the role. So you actually don't need to maintain that, and that is quite good in the case uh, that you know new people join the com- join your team or people leave the team, uh, and that makes it a lot easier to to actually uh, you don't need to go and revoke access and whatnot because that's connected to an ID. Um, also, if you want to. You know, see if you are if you have too much too much if you are being too permissive in the IAM policies, go and check the IAM access analyzer that allows you to actually check uh, those policies uh, and then give you some recommendations on that. So sorry, this was a bit too long on the IAM part, but I think it's definitely worth it because this is something that I see over and over and over, which is the misuse of of, uh, of identity and access management. The next one is encryption and secrets, which is one of my favorite. Uh, and it is my favorite because there, when, you are, when you are doing encryption, when you are doing secret handling, there's a huge secure, positive security impact. This is something that really strengthens your secu- the security of your solution. And I like it so much because the, the cost impact is minimal, both in the time that you spend and also in, the, in your AWS build. Most of these things are actually available there for free uh, and they are super simple to enable as long as you know what you need to enable. Um, and there's also, of course, a positive correlation with, with compliance, right? If you need to follow certain compliance programs, uh, one of the things that it will kind of mandate is that you are doing encryption uh, in transit and at rest. Right? Um, when it comes to encryption in transit, essentially you can use AWS Certificate Manager, uh, which allows you to issue SSL TLS certificates to use in ELBs, uh, in CloudFront, uh, et cetera. Uh, when it comes to encryption at rest, you can use AWS Key Management Service or KMS to short, uh, where you can, you know, you have direct integrations with the Elastic, uh, elastic vo- uh, volumes, with, with RDS databases, with S3, with Dynamo. So basically you can create that KMS key and, and use it to encrypt the content of the, all the encrypted, all the content that is at rest. And basically it's kind of like one thick box uh, or in infrastructure as code, one line. And that makes it so much uh, secure, right? Um, the other type of, of the other, in, on the other side of the coin, when it comes to the application that you are running in AWS, I think the secret handling is something that, that often is kind of like missing. Um, it's something that is also kind of quite straightforward to enable and to use. You can use both the AWS Secrets Manager or the AWS Systems Manager Parameter Store, ah, quite a mouthful of name, so SSM for short. And you can use that to actually uh, store and encrypt uh, passwords, license information, and API keys. So, or whatever actually text information you want to, to, to do, any kind of secret really. So you can actually use one or the other service for that. There's some light differences between. Uh, uh, behind the, the scenes, they will, you actually will connect that with the KMS key. So it will be encrypted with that. And essentially you, you can, you define that secret there and your applications can, can simply kind of pull that secret uh, via an API. And everything is done, of course, in the background also with the IAM roles and policies. So everything done is done in a secure way, a secure way. So you don't need to, you know, store these uh, passwords or API keys in in the code or hard code them uh, even. Um, so you can actually use this to actually have a more healthy management when it comes to secret handling, and it's actually quite simple to do. So you know, definitely check it out, uh, either one or the other one. Um, I think that you could imagine that the difference here would be that you know, Parameter Store allows you to do uh, to, to store any parameter, not necessarily uh, secrets. So you, so you can have a secure string for the secrets and you can have a normal string for non-secrets. Um, secret manage, uh, secrets manager 
is kind of a different service that is specifically for secrets and allows you to to include like the rotation of secrets. So for instance, uh, if you are using uh, an RDS database, you can store the root password, uh, sorry, the root, uh, yeah, the, the password for the, the, the root of the database in secrets manager, and you can define that automatically rotate every X amount of time. So there's some advantage in using one or the other or both. So uh, definitely something for that you should explore and it's not that easy or complicated to do. The seventh sin is missing out on interesting data. This is something that it's kind of like, it's not a, a challenge, but it, it's, it's really something that over and over I see that, that uh, development teams uh, forget to do this in projects. And, and it's kind of, once you don't, if you are not doing that, it's very kind of, uh, you don't really, you cannot really, you know, go back and, and do it. So for instance, there's a lot of data sources that are available out of the box in AWS. Common examples are like CloudTrail that I actually mentioned in the, in the beginning of this talk um, to, to basically automatically log any API internal, AWS APIs uh, requests that, that happen in the account, the VPC flow logs to, to log the network traffic and the ELB uh, so the load, load balancer access logs where you can actually log that automatically log the traffic that happens in the load balancer. These are things that are basically you can enable in less than, less than five minutes. And there's a lot of valuable information here. So you can use for instance to, to troubleshoot. Uh, you can, can see like, you know, are there any kind of, for instance, requests hitting this load balancer and where is the request coming from? As an example, so you can use that to trouble. You can use this data to troubleshoot. You can use it also for auditing and compliance. So you can actually use that to 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 have an audit trail of what's happening, uh, for instance, on the account or in the in the in the VPC. You can use that for analytics. So you can actually go and check like what are the type of traffic hitting that load balancer. And, and you can actually get some valuable information from that. And also for CM, so for security incident and event management. So when we are looking uh, at uh, for security intelligence, essentially, you can, you can use this data points to feed that. For instance, if you are using uh, AWS Guard Duty, which is a service that, that is available there, you can actually uh, use these data sources to correlate with uh, information coming from security threat feeds and it basically allows you to identify potential threats uh, and take action on that. So these are things, these are like, even if you don't want to, to go all the way to, to having a security incident and event management, I mean, just enable those things because you, if you don't enable, then you cannot go you know, retroactively and see what happened three months ago. So uh, definitely something that you should enable even if you don't want for the security part uh, at the start. And you know, I know that this is kind of like, there's a lot to process. Um, I think that, you know, one of the things that, that I learned in the past um, years is that, or in the past few, few months is to actually start uh, using a process called a well-architected framework as part of my software, uh, software lifecycle. So, this is not a pitfall. This is something that, that can kind of tie all of this kind of together in a way. Um, the well-architected framework is something that you can find in the AWS page and it focused on five core pillars. So operational excellence, security, reliability, performance efficiency, and cost optimization. And it's a, a practice that we are doing, uh, in, starting to do in Fortum. It's a practice that I've been doing with, with several customers as a consultant. And it's something that provides so much value, right? Because you you can do this every X amount of months in the project. And basically you are with the team uh, kind of looking at under this lens and you can actually see like how the project has been uh, evolving in terms of what are the gaps, what are the, what are the risks, how big of a risk it is and how do you see that? Uh, and it, it's, it, it's it kind of the outcome is, is really good. Um, in addition to the five core pillars, there's actually like additional lens uh, that you can you can go and check. So you can actually have like kind of extra lens than these core ones, like for instance, for serverless, for machine learning, uh, for analytics, for IoT, 
And basically, this is like best practices, essentially. So if you don't, if you're not familiar with the concept, go and check it out and um, ask someone to to facilitate the process because it's really good and it really kind of kind of times this together. So that's it from my side. I hope that this was uh, that you found this beneficial and curious to hear your insights. Um, if you learned something or if if this was all kind of uh, already kind of done deal to you. Um, I know that there's a lot of content to here packed. And if, you know, if there's something that caught your eye, feel free to reach out on Twitter or on LinkedIn and give a shout out. And thank you so much. It was a pleasure to be here today.